This is The First Stop, a podcast with the aim of exploring the minds of artists in and around New Haven. Jeff Ostergren is a multimedia artist working in sculpture, painting, performance, and digital video. His work tackles addiction, desire, corporate greed, legal drug abuse, philosophy, and gender, among other things. In much of his art, Jeff examines the ways in which our bodies absorb substances like pharmaceuticals and processed food and are altered by them. He also investigates how the corporate messaging for these products can lead us into a physical and psychological dependency, while at the same time becoming its own kind of mind-altering drug. In this podcast, we'll be discussing several of Jeff's hyper-saturated abstract paintings, which are made up of pigment, crushed pharmaceuticals like Viagra and Zoloft, and artificially flavored foods. The paintings often take on the bright corporate hues found in medications and sports drinks. We'll briefly discuss Jeff's early performance work, as well as his darkly humorous video work satirizing pharmaceutical ads. The works discussed in this podcast can be found on our blog at firststopart.com. I think one of the things that you kind of reveal in your work, it's not something that we don't know about, but your work really drives home the lack of subtlety of advertising. But at the same time, advertising is so subliminal. It's this weird kind of um, duality with, with the advertising where they trick us into thinking that it's about something and then they show us all this stuff that suggests something else. Like the the more obvious stuff is like pharmaceutical ads seeing just like happy families walking in front of big white houses with yellow labs and stuff and the lighting. I wanted to play the ask your doctor ad which is basically a montage of all these different pharmaceutical ads. Um, So let's let's just play that. Ask your doctor. 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 Ask your doctor today. Ask your doctor. 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 When I was watching that, I started thinking about that. Um, what are they called? That media company that's been buying up all the all the local news. Uh, Sinclair. Sinclair Media, a little like a little bit, even though. It's different from Sinclair Media. There was this sense of the insidiousness of these advertisements, just the way that you like focus in on that and sort of pull it out. I don't know, there was something about that that was kind of, it was really spooky. How did you kind of come up with that idea? I think it just, uh, I mean, this is where it's sort of, at least in my head, the work gets like kind of wonky. I just sort of became really, really interested in these pharmaceutical ads for, as these kind of standalone objects. They're kind of, they're impeccably crafted and beautiful and sort of surrealist in their own ways. Um, but in doing research about them, it, you know, I sort of discovered all these things in terms of, there's actually very few countries in the world that allow this kind of direct-to-consumer marketing of pharmaceuticals. So the U.S. is mm-hmm. one, Canada's another, I think New Zealand, and just a couple others. Most countries don't. And so... Um, but in, in many of these places like the U.S., you they sort of are more or less required to follow a kind of certain set of standards of, in their script. So they have to in, include side effect, a list of side effects. Um, many of them include this seem to, whether it's sort of necessary or not, but they include this phrase, ask your doctor. Um, there's other kinds of uh, small print warnings that have to sort of be displayed on there. Um, but it... You know, absolutely, when you sort of do that, when you cut that phrase out, ask your doctor, you know, leaving it with the original image that's on there intact, and you sort of start to stack those up, it becomes this really crazy, uh, it becomes a sort of crazy form of language repetition, but then you really begin to see what the underlying image is, right? Which is, um, it it becomes this interesting way of sort of letting the viewer see all these kind of disjunctive images that are sort of happening along with with this text you know which which is Absolutely. creepy in itself the you know ask your doctor ask you. it becomes a, a mantra in a sense but um but it's also you know it's it's in part sort of contributing to the the massive amount of pharmaceuticals 
um, consumed. When I was watching some of those performance videos where I think there was one where you're kind of like, I don't know if I, I might be conflating a, f a few of them together, but you're, um, I think you have a green mask over your face. Mm hmm. Yep. And you're like, there's a wine barrel. Right. And you're sort of gluttonously drinking wine out of it or out of a bag. It kind of gave me this sense of um, maybe what it looks like when you go into your studio <laughs> late at night. <laughs> like, you know, and I, I really pictured before your studio renovation, Jeff in the garage, like making work and doing like weird stuff. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. No, I mean, I think that... Uh... Maybe it's not totally unlike that. I mean, that was that was actually a piece that I did um, back when I was in L.A. in my studio in, in Los Angeles. So, um, but it was sort of part of a big a big project um, that, in some ways, yeah, has a, has a nice parallel to just sort of daily art practice. But you know, sort of sort of built upon all these other kind of themes that you mentioned earlier. Yeah. Do you consider the work that you do, the sculptures that you make, the paintings that you make, um, is, is that process to you kind of performative? Yeah, to some degree. I mean, it's um, I'm very interested in sort of the idea of, of working with the sort of especially these um, kind of molecular objects that we ingest. So, you know, whether it's pharmaceuticals or snack foods or energy drinks, they have they have various forms, right? They have a kind of molecular form that, that impacts the body literally. They have a, a visual form that either draws us to them or repels us uh, from them. They have a, a form of advertising, a set of visuals with that. Um, so when in making the work, sometimes I'm really interested in this idea of sort of like a, a transference or a contamination um, in a way that when we ingest something, it, it, it alters our body. And that may be an uh, intentional ingestion, um, a scheduled pharmaceutical or bag of Doritos you buy down at the, the corner store, um, or it can be incidental, right? We have traces of pharmaceuticals in our drinking water. Um, and I'm interested in this idea in the same way that, you know, when you are walking down the street, you don't know what's in somebody's body. Um, you don't necessarily know what's in the, in all of these objects without, without me telling you so. But, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I am interested in this process of, of, infusing them with with things sometimes that can be a very especially in the, the painting process where i'm mixing in these objects and sometimes actually pressing canvases mm -hmm. together um almost like a i sort of think of it as like a frottage process right and so it's it's almost a um a physical transference between between works so that multiple works um will contain the same materials they pass them between each other just as humans can pass uh ideas uh, diseases, um, you know, um, sort of influences back and forth between each other. So, uh, you know, I don't want to go in there to make some, I don't necessarily think of it as purely performative, but I think there is that element in there for sure. Right. So, um, gosh, there's so much, I feel like there's so much to talk about with your work. Um, when you were mentioning the frittage, um, it made me think of the mechanical paintings you sort of already described the process, but would you mind describing those particular paintings and the what you do? Sure, yeah. I mean, um, and there's sort of a you know, wide variety of ways in which I sort of end up doing it. I'm not, I'm not very consistent in what I do sort of intentionally, but um, in general, I sort of try to, to build up a series of layers on, on one or more canvases at the same time um, in which I'm applying paint, uh, sometimes pigment, sometimes um, directly applying um, uh, some kind of substance, whether it's an energy drink or um, a uh, weed killer, alcohol, kind of, you know, actually sort of just applying them directly. Sometimes it's mixing them in with the paint. Um, it, 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 and, you know, I'm not being terribly sort of uh, clear about it, but it's not really clear when I, when I actually make it. Sometimes it's purely abstract. Sometimes I'm actually trying to paint something. But it usually involves kind of producing a layer on one surface, producing a layer on another surface, and then sort of pressing them, rubbing them together, you know. And um, frittage has this kind of, uh, it can have sort of a fairly innocuous meaning in terms of um, just sort of a rubbing, right? You can sort of create uh, gravestone rubbings and things like that. But it also has a kind of sexualized meaning as well that I'm certainly interested in playing off of those things. But um, 
I think it's interesting to put, kind of put these things together to create then this kind of transference, but then also to um, to create some kind of simulation of, of contact between whether it's between humans or between ideas or substances. Um, sometimes it'll be between sort of two canvases, and that make they'll make up like a diptych when they're finished. Mm-hmm. Other times I use uh, magazine pages and sort of will press them throughout the the, the uh, larger canvas. Um, or I even use the magazine pages some, oftentimes to clean up this kind of excess paint and then press them to produce their own work, sort of producing a large number of sort of smaller uh, associated uh, works. And that's partly, I mean, I probably am making a, you know, a vague environmental attempt to not actually throw any paint away. It's, it's, mm-hmm. There's nothing sort of discarded. Everything is kind of preserved as an, as an object, uh, as an art object. Um, but also, again, the kind of sort of that, there's this kind of residual kind of production that that happens um, as, as things sort of, you know, fade down to nothingness where there's nothing left to, to transfer. Very interesting. That, that makes sense. Yeah, no, it does. I mean, it does make sense. Do you feel like pharmaceuticals is sort of the epitome of what's going on in our society? This sort of way of distracting us from ourselves and influencing us and using hypnotic language does it go beyond pharmaceuticals in your mind? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think I think sort of as you were what you were just saying is 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 a big part of it, right? That um, I think in a lot of ways they are the sort of epitome of thing. I mean, it's it's always been hard for me to really kind of articulate the bigger picture, but for me, it's it's about this sort of uh, repeti- repetitious synthetic sort of bite-sized consumption of things. So, so whether it's a, a pill a day, you know, taken from a bottle or a blister pack that's sort of, you know, every dosage is the same, every, the color is always the same, to that every, you know, Cheeto in the bag that is synthetically produced and, you know, while not identical, you know, sort of a, kind of a set of possible forms. Um, I think we can even extend that to sort of sort of social media and the kind of the, the bite size of the tweet or the, the square Instagram photo that this kind of this kind of steady stream of small bits, right? Um, mm-hmm. part, part of pharmaceuticals, the interest to me has also always been time, right? That there's a kind of regulation of time, whether it's taking one pill a day or going through a, a cycle of birth control pills or, um, you know, a lot of sort of uh, packaging for pharmaceuticals will come if it's sometimes it's a bottle, but you get a, a dosage for a set amount of time, or right? you get a month's dose, um, or you get a blister pack with seven days worth of this and seven days, you know. So it's everything is about sort of regulating time. It's a way of kind of structuring our lives, and that I think falls along with how we our work week. It falls along with our consumption of culture. It falls along with all these kind of structures that that we engage with, and then. Um, and so I'm not. I'm not certainly trying to be romantic about some sort of past before everything was kind of right. in the factory and synthetic. But I'm just really interested in the way that this is. This is kind of present day life where everything is this kind of, um, whether it's uh, something you're consuming or just going to the the dollar store or the grocery store. You know, it's sort of um, everything is highly regulated, highly synthetic. You're going to get the same can of Campbell's soup here as in California. Uh, as in Europe, you know, as in Asia in, in many cases. So it's sort of, you know, how does this, uh, it is a kind of a stand-in, right? And I think pharmaceuticals have this this visual component of the advertising that makes it particularly appealing to me, but it could be probably other things that, that say the same thing. One of the things that um, I started, and I hadn't fully had this understanding about your work, and I should probably pose it as a question still, instead of just like telling you what your work is about, um, no, I'd like to know that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I, I, so this gave me a kind of a weird insight into your work. Uh, so of course I'm taking pharmaceuticals as a lot of people do for various, um, ailments slash perhaps manufactured needs. And one of the pills that I have to take, uh, you have to take it with food and they come in these, they're these little orange kind of shiny objects. Mm-hmm. And they have, you know, a sugar coating. So when you put them in your mouth, you taste like, you know, it tastes sweet, kind of like a vague sweetness. 
and I was rushing and I was chewing on my cereal and I just threw the pill in my mouth and I bit down into the capsule and all the medicine started seeping out and it just tasted like acrid chemical. And um, it started to make me think about what you're doing with your paintings. And I ha tell me if this is true or not, or if you see this, but I see you in some ways as both playing with the idea of the aestheticization of medication using color, as you were talking about the blister packs to kind of appeal to us like fishing lures or something, um, because you're painting, right? You're painting with color. But also it seems to me like you're trying to crack them open and reveal them as a substance that people consume. And there's a kind of muddiness oftentimes, to, especially with some of the synthetic paintings that you did where you're like rubbing them in. Is that, is, is that something that you're thinking about? Are you thinking about this idea of like taking them out of their packaging? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, the packaging is of interest to me, but that, it's of note that that's one of the few things I don't really use in my yeah. works, either sculpturally or or uh, two-dimensionally, uh, I mean, I have on occasion, but uh, I mean, in part that's been really done, like Damien Hurst did a lot with mm -hmm. using the packaging. Um, and the packaging can be interesting, um, but I, I'm ultimately, ultimately interested in, in them as substances, right? And, and mm -hmm. even like a very formal way of, of the word substance, right? That it's some kind of, it has this kind of seriousness to it. Um, a big a big part of the, and this isn't really ever apparent in the work, but just like as part of the mindset behind it is, um, when I started working with pharmaceuticals in, in grad school and art school, I sort of came across uh, this text by Jacques Derrida where he, he talks about this this passage in uh, a work by Plato, I think called the, the Phaedrus, and, and basically talks about this idea of the pharmacon, which is the, the Greek, it's the word Greek uh, origin of the word pharmaceutical, but at this point in Greece, the the pharmacon meant both cure and poison simultaneously. This this substance that you would mm. receive that could be both, and it also meant paint. So it also was a, it was the idea of paint or even like makeup, something uh, a color or a pigment that was applied that could be um, it could be it could hide something as we sort of think mm -hmm. of like makeup hiding something. It could enhance or make something artificial. Um, it had this kind of ominous connection to the body, to the physical, to something being, you know, uh, a, a potential source of a, a cure or, or or something that could be harmful. Um, and so this became really fascinating to me that this single term could kind of encompass all these things. And I began to think about how the similarities in the production of, of medicine and paint over the years, right? So sort of even going back to this interest in the synthetic, you know, um, thousands of years ago, uh, medicine was produced by finding some sort of a substance out in the world, a natural substance, mm -hmm. uh, bark, uh, berries, leaves, and oftentimes breaking that down into something, putting it into a binder, like maybe a rough kind of binder, but some sort of a, a way to consume it. And paint was the same way. Artists would grind their own pigments, make them from minerals and natural substances, um, and they would have to form it with some kind of a binder, whether it was egg tempura or some kind of a, you know, oil-based material. Um, and gradually those have sort of, in some cases, almost hand in hand over the years, moved to a more synthetic kind of production where it's controlled, where it's regulated, where uh, art is a very regulated kind of process with uh, structures of power within it that uh, institutions that approve or uh, you know, uh, reject sort of forms of art and sort of same thing with sort of the medical profession. It's very formalized now. Um, and then, you know, the production of pills and the production of paint are now highly regulated and synthetic. So in the same way we can get the can of soup that's the same anywhere, you're going to get the same pill anywhere and you're going to get the same uh, paint tube of cerulean blue at one art store here or, you know, across the country. So I'm taking the pill out of the package and grinding the pill up back into a powder sort of mm -hmm. returning it, it's not really its natural state because it's synthetic, but re re sort of returning it to as close to a molecular state as I can get it, mixing it in with a paint that often matches the color of the, the logo for the advertising, and then deploying that on a canvas in some way. And, and you know, you use the word muddy, and that, that happens a lot with sort of uh, intentionally where the things sort of mix together so that, you know, if um, the... Uh, 
Viagra Blue and the um, uh, orange for uh, sort of Adderall mixed together in, in, the, in the canvas, they're gonna, it's going to produce a kind of muddy color, right? I sort of, mm -hmm. um, I tend to work intentionally sort of, um, sort of very sort of aggressively, you know, uh, sort of while paint is still wet, so things kind of bleed together. Um, are you trying to subvert the messaging that these these pharmaceutical companies are trying to promote by neutralizing the colors? It's a, I mean, it's. I don't know if I'm explicitly trying to do that. I think that maybe is an interesting kind of result of it. Um, I think I'm just sort of trying to sort of mimic the way that things get diluted and even in in our in our bodies, right? Mm -hmm. That that things kind of. Um, things aren't clean you know they start out as these kind of clean pristine kind of pills and they go into your body and they're absorbed and then they they work or they don't work or they have side effects or they combine with other medications that you're on to produce kind of side effects or they combine with you know if you took that pill without the food it would have a different effect on you than if it you took it with the food and you know it's yeah i sort of like the idea of it being i mean i, I like the the paintings that make are sort of messy and kind of not necessarily intentionally ugly, but they they aren't necessarily um, you know intentionally beautiful either. They have a kind of just sort of a, a rawness to them, which I think is to me is sort of very very human. So and there's sort of a digestive intestinal right quality to them. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. I see that. I see the way that they sort of bleed into that that painting profit. Mm -hmm. um, that's probably that's the least muddy actually of them, but it sh sort of shows maybe if we were l l using the digestive tract as a metaphor, like the moment it all hits the stomach and starts blending into each other, it's almost like a f kind of frozen moment. In this particular one, we're working with Mio Water Enhancer. Mm -hmm. Can you describe what that is? Yeah, it's some uh, some kind of a thing that you put into. It's like a little little bottle, and you it's sort of um, uh, heavily pigmented and flavored. So you would just uh, squirt a little bit of into your regular glass of tap water to give it some extra flavor. Um, but the you know I'm I'm interested in it because the the colors are so bright. The commercials are strange. They kind of have this kind of hallucinogenic quality to them. The commercials also mimic a lot of kind of art pieces that have been about. Um, artists sort of squirting pigments into water and letting them diffuse and things like that. They're kind of very mm -hmm. aestheticized and um, especially because they're they're sort of excessively pigmented because they're meant to be diluted in in water. So they're great if you sort of spray them on the canvas that becomes a very sort of um, abstract expressionist kind of splattery quality. And then when it dries it, some of the pigments fade, some of them uh, blend and sort of become really muddy and others become, you know, sort of really, really bright on the canvas when they dry. Interesting. Um, so I mean, in that case, it's a very specific, that piece that there's no, no pharmaceutical content. So it doesn't, doesn't have to have that, but it's again, the sort of very, um, kind of interesting synthetic project, uh, pro product that, that, you know, becomes used to produce a certain, a certain look. And it sort of becomes a, it's almost an invented need. Right. Right. Like yeah. we need water. We don't necessarily need our water to have a certain right. unnatural color. It doesn't need to be wild berry flavor. Yeah. You know, like, and, um, yeah, and these, you know, and all these things have a, a very set palette in a way, too. You know, the, these products have, you know, there's not that many colors that are used at the end of the day, like, you know, in terms of our logos and advertising, there's, you know, reds and oranges and yellows and blues maybe green a little bit, purple, you know, but it's like these it's these very sort of, it's a surprisingly sort of generic usage of, of color, um, which is interesting. That is interesting. It would be interesting to figure out what the research is on particular colors. I mean, obviously the blue Viagra is a kind of gendered color, mm -hmm. but then s certain things that are, you know, meant to be consumed or you think about like the mcdonald's red and you know people used to tell me that it was supposed to make you hungry or something like that but uh right yeah there's all kinds know. of sort of psychological profiles on what these colors do and whether those they're being used that way or not is is uh, unclear um you sort of already talked a little bit about you know the frittage process and the i guess you put you paint onto like a plexi or plastic with these is that true in some cases, yeah. In some cases, I would. And you rub it in. 
in most of the cases for these, I was painting onto the canvas itself and then rubbing it against another canvas or in some cases against a sheet of plastic and then often leaving it the sheet of plastic attached mm -hmm. to the front. Um, it was using mostly oil, so it wouldn't it wouldn't um, dry and stick to the plastic, but it warped the plastic oh, over wow. time from the um, the very sort of oils and the the thinner in there. And was the plastic meant to stay on the canvas forever? No, it, was, it was meant, it was to, meant be to be removed. removed so yeah, it was it was just a means of kind of kind of creating the image, and then it would be you know sort of discarded as um, kind of a intermittent acne sufferer. I sometimes watch these YouTube videos on like different ways of, you know, dealing with acne or treating it or treating acne scarring. And there's this thing called derma needling. And there are these procedures people have and they stick needles into their face. Okay. Like they have a certain length. And the idea behind it is you kind of are supposed to stimulate collagen growth. And then they'll put some kind of medication or ointment, or sometimes it's like stem cells, and they like rub this kind of gel onto plastic stuff and just like lay it over the face. Hmm. And for some reason, when I was reading your description on your website, just because I'm thinking about medical stuff when I, that's not all I think about when I see your work, but I just thought of that for some reason, like the body absorbing chemical or substance through the dermis um and these paintings are sort of like that yeah in a well, way. i mean i think a lot of people think about can think about painting as like a, a skin right a right canvas as a kind of skin and um so absolutely i mean i think if, if i'm if i'm interested in absorption and contamination then then i've got to be thinking of these things as um skins in some ways i mean some of them are these the sort of taller pieces in, the, in this particular series that we've been talking about are they're actually sized to be the the height of the average American human. Oh person. wow! So they're they're cool. they're and they're oriented vertically. So they're they're pretty explicitly kind of figurative, right? Um, mm -hmm. There's no figurative uh, uh, imagery in them, or, or none, in, in very little intentionally. Um, but they're yeah they're t so I think that's a really great way to think about it is that there's a kind of um, relationship to the to the body right the skin the skin is one of our means of keeping things in and out the other is like our our senses or our brains in some ways right of processing rejecting yeah. information uh, accepting information and so i think it's interesting to think about how things get through those those barriers um sometimes it's the crazy advertisements sure right? yeah sometimes it's the creative sometimes, sometimes it's, it's drugs right sometimes it's drugs sometimes it's twitter sometimes yeah. it's you know crazy uh you know um uh, talk show radio hosts that are barraging people with these kind of stories that, um, you know, become sort of s slip into their consciousness um, in their in their worldview. So I think there's a lot of ways we can look at these things. And your diptych paintings are sort of a, I mean, they can be seen as a bunch of different things. You mentioned binary code, but they're also in some respects a kind of stand in for for the human brain or the animal brain, right? In in that they're you, you mentioned them as as hemispheres. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like the, I like the idea of thinking. I mean, and that and I like the the openness of a hemisphere. It could be a global hemisphere. Mm -hmm. It uh, could be a brain hemisphere. Um, but I, I've always been interested in that too. The, this kind of split brain, this two the two halves of the brain, and this kind of various biological and sort of mythological ways we think about that you know i mean we talk about the left brain and the right brain being different and they they are to some degree but it also seems like there's evidence that it's not always the case uh or, or that that certain brains can take over functions from the other if one side is injured and so they're kind of adaptable in a way um but i'm interested in, in that i mean that's part of how i like to to think about um the the diptych pieces and um putting them together makes sort of like a full sort of object in a way I immediately thought of the Rorschach test when I saw that you press them together just because that's one of, that's sort of, they don't look like ink blots at all, but the method of folding made me think of, of the ink blot that's used in psychological testing. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, it's actually something I've had to try to avoid with them because yeah. it's sort of so, it's such a, um, 
uh, an immediate result so many times when pressing them together. And it's also there's something so there's something so pleasurable about making Rorschach, ink, you know, like just taking pages and folding them with with paint or ink in the middle. There's something yeah. I, I find very sort of soothing and interesting. It's both kind of um, it involves chance, but there's also some kind of level of control over it. So, um, and it's something that many artists have done. So I've I've had to kind of consciously at times avoid. <laughs> There'll be right. times when I'll, I'll right. make something and it looks too much like a Rorschach and I'll then cover it with other layers or, or remove it mm -hmm. and, and sort of sort of start over um, to sort of prevent that from happening. But I, I think that's sort of bound to be uh, an incidental read and that's that's certainly okay. It's certainly something that people can relate to. So so with the diptychs, do you, you work on them as separate paintings. Is that correct? Like you take two paintings, you work on them as separate paintings, and then you put them together and kind of print the yeah. other ones information onto the, is that how that works yeah it, and again i sort of intentionally the system is uh it's it's open so there's a constant variation but that's definitely something i do a lot will be to, to be to paint on them each individually sometimes it's the, uh, the same image sometimes it's a mirrored image and then sort of press them together and sort of transfer portions of that image together um, but then sometimes I'll also paint and treat them as a single image and paint a sort of scene that flows over both of them. Uh, other times I'll be sort of creating sort of abstract kind of printings or pressings on both of them. Um, I also change the position of them constantly, sort of flipping mm. them upside down. So it's never, it's never a kind of clean mirrored image. Right. Um, in, intentionally I sort of try to make it that, um, if no matter how they're kind of arranged, in which would however next to each other, there would be a kind of relationship. Sometimes they're sort of being sort of uh, connected horizontally or then vertically, and and if the viewer wanted to, they could take some time and try to put things together. They could see that how there are lines that move through um, both of them, but are not connected because of how they're positioned. So it's, mm. um, I mean, that's one of the things that I think again maybe makes the work challenging sometimes is that it. It doesn't have a really obvious sort of read in terms of how it was made. It's, um, I, I tend to get bored if the system is really um, very clear cut. So I sort of keep I keep changing it up. I keep altering it, um, but that makes it less clear in terms of, of the final production. But I guess that's that's sort of interesting to me to have this kind of um, there's clues in there, but there's also a lot of ambiguity. I guess I really really like visually the magazine diptychs a lot what made you decide to work with a non-archival material like oil paint that is going to eventually eat away at the magazine pages rather than something like acrylic or or a gouache or something like that i mean i definitely do some in, in acrylic and, and gouache but but no matter what the because in most cases i'm using the for these smaller pieces on on actual magazine pages I'm, I'm using um the 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 magazine page itself right so it's it by definition it's not archival magazine pages. right that's they're, true they're thin they're flimsy um the ink is sort of not meant to be archival um they're, they're meant to be disposable right just like a, a newspaper um so i mean in part you know it's I think the, the just like the talking about the sort of uh, moving image television commercials before, uh, I think the the magazine ads are also kind of a you know like a still version of that, and they're also the, to me these kind of very beautiful, powerful uh, objects. And so, um, even though it, in some ways it seems limiting in a way in terms of their archivalness, um, I like having some version of the work that that has that kind of really explicit reference to the to the origin right so if i paint on a pharmaceutical ad it's just sort of right there in your face or a, a, a financial company ad um you know you get this kind of really kind of immediate indexical kind of relation this is what i'm talking about right and it's the painting is happening on there um it, and you choose to reveal certain parts of ads or certain phrases that seem to have a a meaning to you right yeah and so I mean sometimes uh, there's some that I do where I cover the whole page and there's nothing left uh, they could be monochromes or sort of you know just super saturated with paint other times it's just a small amount and other times yeah it's a very kind of um, intentionally sort of like leave this kind of amazing catchphrase or amazing amazing kind of image sort of present um, 
I mean, at the end of the day, I probably justify it in the sense of it's it's it goes back to again, like sort of the body, right? That our bodies are not archival. Our bodies absorb things and break things down and have half lives, and our bodies themselves eventually will, you know, will collapse and break down and die and and rot, mm-hmm. right? So that, um, you know, most of my work isn't really archival in a way, mm-hmm. and that's I guess kind of okay with me. Um, mm-hmm. uh, I don't know that. that down the line, maybe that presents a problem to conservators, and that's you know I've I've talked to a couple of conservators at the point that said described my work as a, as a nightmare to deal with, <laughs> you know, um, but that's uh, that's probably you know long after I'm I'm gone, so um, you can let them and, deal and, with and, it. And conceptually, I guess I don't I guess I don't mind that that, that there's a kind of um, built-in decay to the work. A lot of, there's a lot of work that I like that exists in that way where it's it hasn't aged well over the years. What are some some works that that you really admire? Uh, let's see. I mean, there's, there's so many, I feel like that are, that are influential. Um, I mean, in terms of works that say to say are, are not archival, you know, the works of say, um, Alberto Burry or Eve Klein, where these mm-hmm. kind of really kind of aggressive takes on paintings where they're being burned and kind of, um, stitched together and kind of, you know, really kind of aggressively treated Klein's interest in, in pigments, um, uh, his, his IKB international Klein blue, um, Another artist that's really kind of dominant for me is uh, Eduardo Palozzi. He's a sort of British mm-hmm. sculptor, um, and also made these really kind of amazing um, prints. He was a great printmaker, um, silk screens and uh, lithographs. Um, and I'm more more interested in his his sculpture in particular, um, but where he's sort of pressing all these different objects into things and creating these sort of distorted um, figurative shapes or using objects of sort of industry to kind of combine these sort of um, kind of mutated forms. Um, so there, I mean, there's sort of kind of some different uh, older artists, I think, that that have been a big influence. Um, Eva Hesse and, and her work in terms of just sort of experimenting with forms and, and alternative materials or Linda Bangless in the same way, kind of combining things. I think sort of more recent artists, um, people like Rachel Harrison, um, her use of color and, and objects and it's really kind of um, uh, really kind of powerful. Um, Heim Steinbach or um, somebody like that kind of using, again, kind of found objects in a certain way. Um, painting wise, I think, um, you know, I've been influenced by a lot of uh, German painters uh, like Sigmar Polka, who was really experimental in his use of materials or um, Martin Kippenberger, I think for him, maybe more in terms of the imagery that he would just kind of this huge, broad range of imagery and sort of un, being unafraid to kind of take on, um, a lot of, a lot of different, different perspectives. Um, uh, and then Mike Kelly is probably another artist who had an influence, maybe not so much in terms of the visual influence, but just in terms of his interest in kind of taking apart culture and really mm-hmm. kind of, um, really sort of being unafraid to kind of dissect something and kind of reconfigure it into something else. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's, those are just a few. I mean, there's, I feel like there's so many what? people that are really kind of, kind of uh, significant to me. How do you feel about Paul McCarthy as an artist? I think his, I think his work is, uh, his body of work is, is amazing. I think his take on his, the way he explores culture is amazing. Um, the scope of what he was been able to do in terms of sculpture and installation is is pretty breathtaking. Um, I think sometimes I question some of the the politics of the of the work in some ways. I think it, it can. I don't know if it goes too far, but it it's that kind of challenge. If you're if you're mimicking something, are you are you reproducing it? In a way? That's a good point. Yeah, um, I asked that in a way because I saw a little like I saw a smidgen of him in your performance work. Mm-hmm like sure. acting out the excesses of i don't know life in america right <laughs> you know i mean he was he's he is he's still such a presence in in la where i went to school i think it was hard for him not to be kind of mm-hmm. present in most performative work um i mean i ultimately i have sort of ceased that kind of performative work in part because it seemed like it was reproducing things in a way that wasn't useful maybe kind of a similar issue that I would have with, with his work. Um, I mean, mine was on such a smaller scale and, and not even, a, not nearly as precise as his work. So 
Um, I've, I've always completely loved the way that he used things like ketchup and mayonnaise and chocolate as these kind of stand-ins and as these kind of um, substances that are so ubiquitous. That was absolutely had been, has been an influence in my work in mm-hmm. terms of um, you know how I've how I'm able to sort of take these objects from pop culture, um, from popular consumption, and, and use them. So. Um, so I'm sure he was he was someone who was influential in, in the in those kind of early performative works. When did you decide you wanted to become an artist? It was pretty late in the process. I mean, I I majored in anthropology and, and gender studies in undergrad, and I worked in um, museums, art museums, for a while. After that, it sort of morphed into you know I realized I was interested in I'd always been interested in art, but I didn't really make a lot of it, and then. It wasn't, you know, I didn't go back to school until I was 28. So sort of maybe when I was 26, 27, I started to say, I'm working in museums. I should make art too. And so I started making art and made a portfolio and started applying to grad schools and, um, you know, began sort of making that my main, you know, sort of goal from there out. Um, But it was a little bit later than a lot of people. I never went to a traditional art school. And so even some things like the painting I do is sort of, um, I don't want to say self-taught, but but it's um, I did not have the kind of basic introductory classes for it that a lot of people go through in the kind of standard art program. When you look back at your childhood or your life, does it make sense to you that you became an artist? Hmm, it's an interesting question. Um, I'm not really. <laughs> <laughs> I mean. It makes sense in the, in the in the sense that you know my my parents were great about exposing me to art. We would go to a lot of art museums uh, when I was a kid from a you know an early age, and I you know had a real appreciation for it. I remember going to, you know, sort of very kind of popular kind of stuff, impressionist shows and whatnot, but also wrestling with something like Agnes Martin. Uh, as a you know, probably a young teenager and just being confused by it, but somehow being intrigued and wanting to to know more. Um, so, but you know, I I don't know. In in high school, I I did a photography class that I really liked and I think did okay at. Um, but I I sort of liked a lot of things. I liked literature. I liked physics um, and science. Um, and I started school sort of thinking I was going to be more like a, an engineer or a physicist or something. Um, and then some, for, you know, for some reason that just wasn't working and I moved into more sort of social science, historical kind of things. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, I don't, I don't, I don't think in a lot of ways it makes a lot of sense that, that I'm an artist. It's a kind of, it's a, it's a cool question because I, I don't, it's definitely not a path that I would have seen from early on or that, yeah. Um, it wasn't when, like I was particularly skilled at drawing or painting or anything as a kid, you know. When you were um, in high school, what did you think you were going to be? I think it was along the lines. I mean, my my dad was an engineer, um, so I, it, you know, I, I think I sort of sort of thought I would follow in those kind of footsteps with a kind of good, solid, paying job, you know, reliable employment. Um, and so, you know, I, I think, yeah, I think I, I thought of lines, uh, along the lines of that, like I was going to sort of go to college and get a job in some kind of industry, some, you know, physics or chemistry or engineering or something, all of which I did well at and really liked a lot. You know, I, that was definitely kind of my sort of thought point. And once I started going to college, I just, they were both sort of too hard for me and too uninteresting in a way. Mm-hmm. Maybe that's why they were hard is I just, I sort of lost interest in them and suddenly, um, you know, all these things that I hadn't really looked at before, like gender studies or like, you know, kind of looking at different cultures and anthropologically became so much more interesting. There were things I hadn't really covered in high school. And so it was sort of that became really. Yeah. How did you end up majoring in gender studies? I mean, it sounds like it became something of great interest to you, but what was it? Was it the first you just sort of took a cl- class, you were interested in it, and then it took off I mean I had I had friend I had some you know female friends who were taking classes in it and we, we would all be talking about stuff and I don't I don't really know I mean I've I've uh, I've sort of been asked this or asked myself this before I think it was just something it was a you know I think as a you know as a typical like angst filled teenager you're trying to make sense of the world and I never quite fit in to like the categories I wasn't a 
jock. I wasn't really like a typical nerd. I wasn't like I wasn't one of the art kids. You know, I wasn't a music kid. So it's sort of I, I didn't really fit into any particular group. And somehow gender studies to me became this fascinating way of like seeing how all these things were constructed. Right. All these. And by mm-hmm. you know, gender studies really expands out quickly to cover class and uh, race and ethnicity and sexuality, and so suddenly you you start to see how constructed all these roles are that were that were placed into, and the kind of norms that that for me being like fairly kind of naive, just you just kind of take for granted, right? Like mm-hmm. men kind of do this stuff for the most part, and women do this stuff for the most part, and yeah, you there's you know people can do anything they want, but it's just kind of this these kind of things, and then in gender studies you get just you start to see like why why that happened and how that right. happened and how and how dominant it is and how hard it is to escape that. And so mm-hmm. there was something about it that I, it's not, not even like I feel like I had a specific question or a specific kind of thing that was answered, but it just, it suddenly just made a lot of sense, you know? Mm-hmm. And so, and, and very little of my work now is about gender, but I still feel like those skills in terms of like dissecting something and, and kind of uh, are really kind of there from that, right? The Not taking thing. stuff at face value. Yeah, exactly, kind of exactly. Investigating and, and understanding that everything is, everything is constructed, right? Nothing is, nothing is really inherent. The things we think are sort of biological or or natural are are, are typically not. They're they're constructed entities in some way, mm. um, and so that yeah, I think that's been, it's been a really valuable skill set that I acquired through that. That's fascinating. Thank you so much for taking the time to stop by the first stop. thought it was a great conversation, and we hope to have you back. All right. Well, thank you very much. It was great. It was great talking. You can follow Jeff on Instagram at Jeff Ostergren, spelled J-E-F-F-O-S-T-E-R-G-R-E-N. Special thanks to Bruce Barber, director of WNHU, for providing the resources and guidance to make this podcast possible. 